Afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Atkinson. I'm the manager of learning adult interpretive programs here at the MCA. Um, before we begin, if I could ask everyone to take out their phones and double check to make sure they're turned off. Um, unless, of course, you're using it for captioning or um, Spanish translation. Uh, thank you all for coming to this critical conversation in conjunction with the exhibition Gary Simmons Public Enemy. Thank you also to our generous funders, a full list of which you can see here. Thank you. Ah, there it is. Okay, great. Fabulous. Um, uh, the exhibition and conversation underscored two deep commitments of the MTA to serve as a site both for the complex conversations of our time and as a place to support artists' work over the whole course of their careers. In 1996, the MCA commissioned Simmons to create wall drawings in the MCA's atrium. In 2001, we co-organized with the Studio Museum of Harlem, the largest exhibition of Gary's work so far. And today, we are honored to open the most in-depth presentation of Simmons' work in Gary Simmons' Public Enemy, extending our commitment to the conversations on race, class, education, and more that Simmons has been mining for decades issues that remain as vexed in the United States as when he started. Joining Simmons on stage today are the curators of the exhibition, Renee Morales, Jadine Collingwood, and Jack Schneider. This is Renee's first major exhibition at the museum as the James W. Alsdorf chief curator, and we are delighted that he was able to steward this exhibition before it travels to his previous institution, the Perez Art Museum, Miami. Collectively, Renee, Jadine, and Jack have worked to bring Simmons' vision to our walls, our Chicago community, and now on stage for us today. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Gary Simmons, Renee Morales, Jaden Collinwood, and Jack Schneider. coming out. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Gary, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to work with you, um, and it's great to have you back here at the MCA. Um, I guess just to kick things off, um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, you came on the scene in the 80s and 90s in New York City. Um, what were you doing then? What were you listening to? What was going on? What, what artists were you looking at? Um, just set the stage for us a little bit. Um, first of all, thank you all for, for coming out and, and um, appreciate you being here. It's a big pleasure to be here. Um, 1980s, what were they doing? I was, uh, I was running around with a lot of clubs, downtown clubs. <laughs> um, I was going to school at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, downtown New York was really popping. I mean, there was, you know, there was this kind of bubbling thing going on in the East Village, which countered like 57th Street and uh, Soho. Mm -hmm. Those were unattainable, unreachable places for us. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kids, you know, there were as many punks as there were hip hoppers. And we hung out in the Roxy. We hung out in the hardcore punk clubs. And, you know, we were just a bunch of downtown kids, like trying to scratch out our thing. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it was, I think, it was, it was a different time, you know, there was a lot of fashion designers and dance troops and musicians, you know, in the East Village and, and like that. And artists, you know, really supported each other. So you, you knew about the Basquiat's and those guys, but um, there was this underbelly that was really kind of crackling downtown. Well, no, that's interesting. Uh, and you mentioned 57th Street and Soho. Um, you know, there, there, there definitely was a lot of political activist type of art happening, but more like on the Lower East Side, right? We're talking like General Idea, yep. Act Up, et cetera. But in these places where, you know, the market sanctioned art of the time mm -hmm. was pretty apolitical, wasn't it? And then like, meanwhile, you're, you're listening to Public Enemy, 
on weekends, nights and weekends, and you know, taking in this kind of like really militant, uh, politicized spirit and yeah. seeing a disconnect there, right? It was, I mean, it was very strange because uh, some of our known uh, artists of my generation anyway, we were all kind of hanging pictures up on 57th Street and in Soho and you know, it didn't occur to us that uh, we would ever show there. It was, it was just wasn't a possibility. Certainly not as an artist of color. I mean, that was um, unheard of, you know. I think uh, Basquiat was like a, an outlier or a unicorn. That was sort of, how did he get in there, you know. Um, very strange. I think there was a lot of political action going on. You know, I was fortunate enough to be around at the beginning of ACT UP. Mm -hmm. And I watched Douglas Crimp and Craig Owens put together, and Greg Bordowitz put together ACT UP on the table at SVA. And, you know, watching those guys quarterback something so meaningful and powerful um, was incredible. So you, you, there was this sense that you had, your, like, your voice and your, we were innocent enough to believe that, like, our art could change how people, you know, viewed the world. And so the general ideas and um, Godzilla and, you know, the Gorilla Girls and things like that, there was a lot of artists that got together. It wasn't like an individual kind of thing. Um, it was much more of a like, loose movement, I guess you'd call it, to the pol political side. Well, you are we're very much carving space within contemporary art, uh, yeah. a space where artists could engage these uh, issues and really try to use their work to create yeah. change. Right? I, you know, I, I think we benefited, I wouldn't say we were fortunate, but we were definitely, we benefited from a crash that happened in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of artists that were making a lot of money mm -hmm. for the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once the art market crashed, I mean, it's, it's hard to describe for younger artists that, because you have generations of kids that have never seen an art crash. Mm -hmm. So um, imagine waking up Today's Sunday, uh, you wake up tomorrow morning and like everything you know in the art world is just gone. Mm. There's, no, there's no sales, there's no anything. People are closing their doors, the whole nine. It, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it mirrored what was going on in the, in the uh, financial situation. So people, instead of putting money into the arts as a kind of investment um, safety um, hold, they kind of dumped everything. So you had all these big name artists that were, their work was getting thrown on the, on the auction blocks in, in, in chunks, you know, blocks of their work. So it just, it decimated their markets. And when that happened, we, there was this kind of hole. Mm -hmm. And in March, you know, those of us that did installation or video or something that took up a lot of space that didn't require a lot of, you know, shipping. Yeah, wall drawing. <laughs> right. Yeah, wall drawing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they, I'd get the call and they'd say, uh, hey, I hear you do some wall drawing. I was like, yeah. yep, just yeah. give me a can of paint and some chalk and I'm good mm -hmm. to go, man. Yeah. So, you know, I think that that opened the door for a lot of us that were, you know, had this voice that we wanted to hear and we could respond. And I think, ironically, I think some of the dealers actually felt a kinship to that political position because they felt very frustrated that, you know, on Friday they were thriving and eating in fancy restaurants like the Odeon and then on Monday, you know, they're riding around doing what was the equivalent of DoorDash back then. Yeah. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, Maybe to get us into the exhibition a little bit. Um, I think we could start with the title, Public Enemy. Um, what does that mean to you? Why title the exhibition this way? Public Enemy, like uh, a lot of my titles, has a, has a very layered, mm -hmm. multi-meaning kind of thing. Some of it's personal that I never kind of reveal. But there's, I mean, with something like Public Enemy, uh, you know, the political voice of a period when they came out and the way it changed um, music and culture, especially hip hop culture, black mm -hmm. culture, 
um, it was, you know, a very, um, it was a strong political voice through music. You know, that was, we used to, you know, you, Chuck D used to say, you know, hip hop is the CNN of the street. Cool. And so I, I literally remember the day that I heard Public Enemy for the first time. I was on a dance floor and a DJ put this music on. I think it was Rebel Without a Pause or My Uzi Weighs a Ton or something like that. And it froze the dance floor. We were all like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and you just kind of knew at that moment that you were in the, like, in the throes of something really important that you didn't totally understand that spoke to you. You know, and the way that uh, Terminator X was cutting was different than anything you'd ever heard before. You know, he was pull he was almost doing something like a Lee Scratch Perry thing mm -hmm. where he was taking, you know, bits, key t uh, tea kettle whistles and things like that that he was sampling. It was, this wasn't just like, let's sample Chaka Khan. This was like, let's sample, you know, odd noises in stairway halls and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, wow, this is amazing. It's very familiar, but I can't, I can't catch what the sample is just sure. yet. And um, for me, that was, it was amazing. And the, the visuals of Public Enemy, you know, they had the S1Ws mm -hmm. with these kind of like brothers that looked like they came right out of the FOI from, you know, mm -hmm. it was amazing. And, and there's Chuck and, and he had his, kind of sidekick, Flavor Flav, and they were just blowing out audiences. It was an insane moment of, of shift from party music to political voice. Mm -hmm. And there was Public Enemy, there was uh, BDP, mm -hmm. you know, like bands like that were really kind of speaking to young youth on the street. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that is, those guys are speaking to me, mm -hmm. you know, this was, like the first time. And it, for me, it really reflected the way punk rock was kind of the voice uh, in Britain at a time mm -hmm. where you, know, you had a certain youth that was affected by uh, you know, social oppression and, and poverty and things like that. And punk rock like, it came out of the ashes mm -hmm. of you know, things like dub and reggae and all the rest of these things that were very politically um, driven, hip hop had a very similar application when it first came out like that. So mm -hmm. the title is born out of a lot of that, you know, and, and I've listened to a lot of PE over the years while I'm making most, most of the pieces, pieces that you're, you're looking, looking at. at. Right. It comes out. And then, of, of course, I mean, you sort of implicitly reference uh, Public Enemy and uh, several other uh, hip hop groups of the early late 80s and early 90s in a series of works titled Backdrop Polaroids, which are included in the exhibition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. upstairs. Um, yeah, so we have a picture here. These are fantastic. These are, um, I, I guess, can you just describe this project for us? This is one of the near and dear projects for me. Um, it basically, at the time, uh, this is late 80s, early 90s, um, driving through Harlem, uh, you would see these kind of street artists that would paint a, back, a backdrop here or there. And y you could stand in front of it and you'd pay like, I don't know, three or five dollars or something to have your portrait taken. And um, people would do it. So I, I looked at that and I thought, wow, this is a really interesting sort of take on portraiture. You know, this is where the subject um, actually is empowered to dictate mm -hmm. um, how they're being viewed by an audience, right? Like they have agency in a way that's like very different than um, other portraits, say like a Vandersee where he's posing and modeling the figure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and presenting them through his lens, so to speak. Um, these street photographs were, were very much uh, the opposite of that. And so I thought, wow, that's a really interesting take on this portraiture thing. Maybe I'll hire some of these guys to paint them for me. And, oh. and then I said, well, hang on a second. Like, I'm an artist. I can paint these things. <laughs> <laughs> what am I thinking about? So um, you have to put I, that I degree to use somehow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, you know, and then it occurred to me that these are uh, the choices that I was making mm -hmm. um, were based on, you know, slang and contemporary, you know, songs that were contemporary to the moment, sure. and, um, Afrocentrism, which was very popular at that time. Um, there, you know, that kind of sense of identity was really strong. And you had mm -hmm. groups like the Native Tongues and Queen Latifah and, you know, who were talking about, you know, be black and proud and, you know, like standing up in your community and things like that. And it was really affecting a lot of the ways even fashion was, was rolled out, you know, and it was, it was a thing. So I, I think I started to, to make these the, the selections and choices myself. And so I took these, these into different neighborhoods. I went through Harlem and, and um, we hung them there. We went to Rucker Park. We went to uh, the African Street Festival in, 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 um, in Brooklyn. Um, we went through Queens. We went through all the boroughs. And it was very, <laughs> it was uh, an interesting sort of, you couldn't do that today. Let's just mm -hmm. say that, you know. Um, we would roll up these tarps and get them through the subway. Anybody that's been in New York that's knows exactly. what that's like. <laughs> of course, nobody said anything to us. We're walking through with these like 10 foot, you know, tubes and moving people out of the way in the subway car. Excuse me, excuse me. And, you know, we'd get uptown and then my assistant would lug all of these photo, you know, um, film. And we'd get there, we'd hang them up, no permits, nothing. Nobody mm -hmm. stopped us, you know. Um, and I would start taking, you know, when you, back then, when you had a camera and you went out on the street and you rolled something like that out, people just lined up. I couldn't, I, I, at certain points we got nervous because we were, there were so many people and we were so outnumbered and people were so excited mm -hmm. that we couldn't, we literally couldn't control our own crowd. Wow. And we could talk to the police to say, hey, can you help us out? Because they would have said, <laughs> where's your permit? So, you know, we were all kind of on our own. And the, the cops anyway thought, like, who are these crazy black people taking all these photographs? And, you know, and so I would take the photograph and then um, I would give the folks in this photograph one for their collection. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask them to keep one for the archive. And um, I mean, we shot well over a thousand mm -hmm. photographs on different days. And it, was, uh, it was amazing because then during the show, we hung all of the, the backdrops along mm -hmm. the gallery walls, and then I had one big grid of about 800 or 900 wow. Polaroid um, you know, images. And then I invited everybody from those portraits oh, to incredible. the show. Yeah. So it was this almost like breach of like, you know, downtown art world mm -hmm. purity and I remember um, I was showing with Metro Pictures and Helene looked at me and she's like, who are all these people? This, <laughs> this, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there was like kids on BMX bikes and like all of the stuff were so in cool. there looking at the photograph, looking for themselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the coolest parts was that everybody said, you know, I've never been in an art gallery before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. Like, we found a way to bring very young kids from the neighborhood mm -hmm. into and be, feel comfortable. Like they're seeing themselves on the walls. And that's when I knew that that's the direction that the work needed to go. Incredible. You know, one thing about this series for me that is so profound is, um, what's this? I, years of looking at your work, uh, during all those years, this project always felt a little bit like it was an outlier. Mm -hmm. in a sense, right? Uh, the wall drawings, the chalkboard piece, everything else feels like very consistent, very much part of this conversation. And this one felt like, for a long time I considered it like a kind of a moment that you kind of took a pit stop and did something different. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that at one point I started looking at these and maybe we can go back to one of the actual um, backdrops uh, over here. Yeah, like that. Um, you know, up until a certain point, I kept you know, looking at your work and like looking at what's in it, right? Looking at the iconography, uh, these little references that uh, give you just enough information to invite you to go down this rabbit hole mm -hmm. of research, of thought, of investigation. 
Uh, so I kept looking at what was there. But then at one point it occurred to me that this project is as much about what's not there as it is about what's there. Uh, it's about the there. That's a good example right there. It's about the missing body, mm -hmm. the absent body, yep. right? And then all of a sudden, that project seemed to be com perfectly, perfectly uh, consistent and uh, in cooperation with, let's say, lineup or uh, step into the arena. Yep. Right. So um, the first room in the exhibition has all of these um, sports-related works, but the way that we framed it is uh, less about sports and more about this missing absent figure, right? right? Uh, not an absent figure, a missing figure, right? Because these are stages that are meant for the display of, uh, of, of a body. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, uh, this question of the, mi the, the missing uh, erased figure. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we went past a, a couple of the images um, from the photos that, first of all, that's one of the few projects that has figuration in it. Um, and what I realized along the way, and this is, this was, uh, I'm not going to take complete credit from it for the front side, but it's sometimes when you're an artist, you're working through things and you start discovering things about yourself and your ideas in the middle of the project, um, I started to realize, wow, this is really a self-portrait without me being in it. So it was everything that was important to me in my world around me. Because in that photograph, those are all friends, like personal friends. In fact, AJ is in there, and Dream Hampton, um, Greg Tate. You know, there's a number there, that photograph there. So the guy in the middle is this guy, Billy Doc. Um, on the left, the hello, uh, my name is, is uh, a poet, rap poet named 99, who was very popular um, back then. It was, you know, Dream is in the original man, making a very strong political statement. You know, it was almost like <laughs> the way that these folks defined who I was. You know, my grandmother used to say, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And, um, that's the clearest example of show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And it sort of set the stage for that kind of what you're talking about, the missing, the absence, the, you know, the, the, the presence, the strength of a presence through its absence. Um, and I think that when you have those kinds of slippages, those kinds of moments where um, bodies are implied but are not in place, you know, you can plug it, it, it calls on the, the viewer to fill in what those absences are. So I think that's one of the, the strong things about um, the lineup piece is that um, we're, we're all very familiar with the, you know, the lineup and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that young black men are rounded up on the streets, Chicago, New York, LA, it doesn't, you pick a city and um, you know, we'll, we'll sort it out later. There's a crime somewhere in the city of Chicago, we might as well, you know, line up the usual suspects. So, you know, you're, you're filling in those shoes with those bodies and those, you know, that horror, that trauma that, that goes on with that on a daily basis. So that's a piece that was done, you know, almost 30 years ago, and it's still as relevant today as it was back then. And that's tragic, you know, I think that. But for me and my studio, that basically set the table for the next 30 years of, of interest mm -hmm. and obsession with um, the, the absence of the figure. I think mm -hmm. that that's, those two, those, that very moment right there was, was uh, very important to me. Maybe that's a good place to also kind of talk about the next section, which um, turns to another kind of institution, not thinking about you know, the police, but thinking about uh, the educational system. 
Um, so the next uh, gallery, we've kind of almost set it up like a simulacrum of like a classroom, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and again, there's like no figures present, um, but there's a kind of indication um, that the figures that you are kind of talking about are young, that they're children. Right. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, your engagement with the educational system? Yeah, I mean, any teachers that are out there are going to probably throw tomatoes at me or something. But, you know, I, I think that uh, for me, you know, I think when I was really little, uh, my parents put me in private school. And then my sister came along. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> that became a different thing, putting two kids through private school. So off Gary went to public school. Yeah. Um, and every once in a while, every couple of Christmases, we get into those arguments. And I go, I went to fucking public school for you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she owes you. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think one of the things that, that defines that now being a parent, I think it's what, what's, uh, what's interesting about my experience through both of those camps was, um, you know, in public school, there's, there's such, you know, just getting books and the books that you're handed out at the beginning of a year was always like the marked up books from previous years. It was never like mm -hmm. the new, clean, mm -hmm. crispy mm -hmm. books in the plastic wrap mm -hmm. and stuff. You know, it was never all of that. It was all the ones that had like things scribbled out or little cartoons in it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was this attitude of kind of, you had kids that were moving ahead of everybody else. And then you had kids that couldn't really keep up with those kids. So teachers were put in a very difficult position. Do I try to speed up the younger, I mean, the, the, the kids that aren't keeping up with the ones that are moving ahead? Or do I slow down the class to bring them back, back down? The problem is when you do something like that is then you get that evil boredom stick, you know, mm -hmm. creeps in the yeah. side door. and that's where kids get lost in the cracks, and that's where your kind of flame starts to go out, and your interest from a very young age mm -hmm. of like, you know, I'm really bored, there's nothing here to stimulate mm -hmm. that, that urge. Um, so, you know, you become the class clown, or you do whatever it is, and you know, then you get accused of being a distraction in school, or whatever, and you know, it's a very difficult thing, and I don't think it's, it's one of those where you're taught a certain track of learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I questioned a lot of that, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I had the fortune of growing up, my cousin, I'm a first generation West Indian kid in New York. And when my cousins came back to visit, you know, from England or Jamaica, or wherever, I realized that their experiences that they were learning and, and the histories that they were learning about was a more global mm -hmm. one. And, and we were learning a much more American centric mm -hmm. through this specific lens. And I, I always felt like kind of half an idiot. Like I was sort of like, why, why am I not learning what's going on in the West Indies or Pan-African you know, issues mm -hmm. or what's happening in Europe and you know, I, all my friends, all my cousins speak like three languages, you know, and here I am struggling to figure out how to speak English. So, it, it, you know, it was a very, the school system is sort of difficult to move through. So a lot of that work really questions the way that we teach and the way that we learn, the way that um, we're indoctrinated into certain things. Mm -hmm. and, um, even something as, as simple as the, as the Pledge of Allegiance. I remember asking, like, why do we have to stand and do this every day? Like, why can't we do this like yeah, once, once a week and get year. on with it, you know? Like, and <laughs> you, you weren't even allowed to discuss why, you know? Like, I thought, in my house, you learn because you're asking the questions. So instead of somebody saying, well, this is the reason why we do the Pledge of Allegiance, it was just like, because that's the way it is. You know, just shut up, sit down, do your thing. <laughs> Put your hand over your heart, by the way. You know, and like all of this. So <laughs> years later, I had to say, well, what, what is the hand over the heart thing? Like, what's that about? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that the, the, the education system really became, I wouldn't say a target, but some, a point of uh, questioning. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
and raising those kinds of questions about what we learned and how, you know, I think K, uh, BDP has a song that you must learn, mm -hmm. which is an amazing song, um, which questions all of those things. Like, you know, KRS-One was, was a rapper that I really admired. And between him and Chuck D, there was always a questioning of education as well, of what are we teaching our kids? Mm -hmm. How are they learning? And how are they moving through the system? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, something like 6X is, is uh, you know, it's kind of the other side of the fence. It's where you're taught hate from a very young age. And um, that's what all that work is about. That's why I, I leave all the little graffiti remnants yeah. on the desks yeah. and all of that. I yeah. like that presence that kind of patina that's created over pulling in that history. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that in relation to what you're saying of like the kid that's kind of bored in class. And that yeah. it's like, but if you look really closely at the desks that are in um, disinformation supremacy board, there's all these kind of, you know, markings. Like I think yeah. like Slayer, Slayer. is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's carved in there. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Um, one of the things that I'm really um, also like about these works is that kind of white on white treatment that you do. Um, I mean, this is, you know, a work like Disinformation Supremacy Board is like um, this moment where the wall of the art institution starts to come through. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that, um, what the wall means for you in, in that piece. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, I, I studied under some pretty great, I was fortunate enough to study under some pretty great uh, minimalists and conceptualists. And um, I was really affected by that kind of stripped down, reductive, you know, whittle the image down to its barest, you know, elements. Mm -hmm. And um, the elegance of uh, scale to a room makes, a, forces a viewer into thinking about um, the room or the architecture that that piece sits in. Um, and in a way, indirectly kind of indicting the, uh, the institution mm -hmm. that it sits in, mm -hmm. particularly in a, in a museum setting, because it, it puts you in that place of, well, now you're, there's a whole track of questions that you're along about what is the institution's involvement in some of this, these questions about race and class and, and, and this kind of thing. So um, that white on white thing is, you know, it's, uh, it, it's throughout, you know. I, you know. I was taught that each element had to have a reason to be there, right? Like you, you know, if you're, if you're painting and you're using color, it's not a random decision. It's a, it's a specific decision. Um, so early on, everything was black or white because it didn't, it, it almost like made the question of color and aesthetics like m moot mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoyed that because it was like, well, let's put all of this stuff aside and get down to the bare bones of what this piece is about and what we're really talking about. We don't need the fluffy part, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> No, it's interesting, and I think um, uh, just as you're talking about color, I mean, the works that we've been looking at thus far are largely from the early 90s, and we have a trio of wall drawings up in the fourth floor lobby, um, which are collectively titled 1964, um, and they're from 2006, and I believe this was the first time with your wall drawings where you rendered them on these really intense fields of color, um, and you talked about how uh, uh, of course, like uh, every decision you make has to have meaning behind it. So I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, why this shift to color around 2006, um, which seems to have uh, affected your work since then, which, in, which incorporates more color than it used to. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, that show uh, is very personal. I mean, I was born in 1964. I think that, you know, the World's Fair was in New York at that time. Um, there was a lot of change. There was a lot of interest in looking towards the future and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, like the Jetsons and things like that. And we were supposed to be riding around in these kind of flotation <laughs> things. Yeah. And you have robots, Rosie the robot in our house, like, 
you know. Yeah. Instead, mm-hmm. we have iPhones. It's very sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, I think that that was always very interesting for me. Yeah. I think growing up in Queens, it's, it's uh, you know the World's Fair. Um, th- those images are so iconic, coming from the airport or going to the airport, or you use it as a, a kind of um, almost mm-hmm. like a lighthouse. Like right. where are you in proximity to Flushing Meadows Park and yeah. um, things like that. So and now it's in a you know a state of you know it's falling mm-hmm. apart. Um, I think it's even you know boarded up or chain linked around, so you can't you know get involved in that. Um, but as a kid, it was always the plate. Like we played around that. Cool. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of history to that that structure. Um, so there's, there's that element to it. But the, the color thing came in with, um, I really wanted to break down, like deconstruct what the film or, uh, yeah, basically film mm-hmm. pattern of RGB, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if you go into your computer and you're you know, separating color or whatever, you have CMYK and you have you know, RGB. And, and so it was these three basic color groups mm-hmm. that make up the video. Um, the pattern, and I thought that, that was very interesting to separate them into three. Like, let's literally, mm-hmm. physically take this apart and put, have a red one, have a blue one, have a green one, you know, like that. Um, so a lot of the images come from around that period, or they speak to um, issues about modernism and, and you know what that is about or for, um, in a in a kind of personal way. But again with a removal. So mm-hmm. I pull myself mm-hmm. out of it. And that's intentional because I think that for me, I mean, I have a lot of friends that paint and you know, make images or, or sculpture that has the figure in it and I, I'm all for it. But for me, I think it's, it's uh, the issues that I'm dealing with. I think once you start bringing that element of the personal in, mm-hmm. the viewer has a tendency to um, disregard it or say mm-hmm. that that's his or her experience, not mine. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I can find an avenue for entry for uh, a viewer in their own terms that's relaxed enough that I'm not preaching at them, like you're allowed to move around in your own terms within this work according to your own memory and how you fill in those gaps. For me, that's when the success starts because I'm reaching different groups, different classes, different you know, um, types of people. Mm-hmm. So um, that piece is kind of the cornerstone for um, taking it from not only about race, but talking about class and other things and other areas of popular culture, like Hitchcock's films and, you know, how women are considered crazy, you know, if they see this color, you know. And, um, all of those things come into play. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that widens or opens up possibilities. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think while we're talking about this body of work, uh, 1964, these wall drawings, um, we have a catalog for the show, um, which is fantastic and is available to pre-order now. Um, Jadeen wrote a really fabulous essay about the 1964 um, project of Gary's. And I'm wondering, could you talk a bit about um, what you learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so one of the things that um, strikes me always about your work is that, you know, there's like a kind of surface level that you can kind of glean from the beginning, but then like if you drill drill really, really deep, like it just keeps on going and there's so many references and so many, I think that like part, like that removal of the individual, Mm -hmm. right? Allows for that, right? So then it's able to kind of touch and dip all these different points and so, um, I really read that work as kind of being about um, really the like systemic ways that certain kind of ideas and political you know concepts or views about the world um, are are kind of embedded in these cultural monuments. Um, so you know, for instance, uh, the the World's Fair um, that that work um, you know. The World's Fair was the brainchild of Robert Moses, this kind of infamous um, urban planner in New York City who basically reconstructed the entire city 
um, to privilege highways in particular. Yeah. Um, and um, so that, in that way, that's why it's so iconic, right? Is because these two highways go like straight around it. Um, and you know, in doing that, really kind of privileged um, the kind of traveling um, people from the you know white suburbanites kind of could come into the city and out of the city without really having to kind of like stop anywhere on the way, right. and it really kind of bulldozed entire neighborhoods, right? Um, so it still to this day has such a kind of radical, um, you know, impact mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the city. Um, and so even just like that, like just having this as this kind of monument of like both the past and the future, I think, you know, it speaks to these larger ways in which, um, you know, literally like racial dynamics in the city are systematized yep. by things like this. Yep. So, yeah. Well, then I think about the glass house as well, which is, which is featured in, in the blink of the eye. And like basically any piece of modernist architecture today is like indebted to this iconic structure by, by Philip Johnson. So in that sense, it is this sort of like foundational design that like continues to like haunt um, architecture today. But then it also has this kind of, uh, you know, somewhat insidious uh, background or inspiration for it, which is that Philip Johnson, um, who was, was a Nazi, mm -hmm. essentially, uh, later kind of, um, had a change, but he, he was inspired by uh, raised villages in Poland that he saw while traveling with Nazi troops. Um, uh, that was part of the inspiration of this house. So, I mean, I mean, there's, there's all these things. Uh, I, I had no idea about this history. Yep. And like this work of yours kind of invites that kind of research and learning. And I think it's part of what makes it really powerful for me. Yeah, I think the glass house is particularly that on so many levels. I mean, mm -hmm. as a structure, um, well, per, first of all, the, just the, the scale, the measurements of the, the structure itself is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, but then and when you start thinking about the idea of living almost in a, literally in a fishbowl, mm -hmm. that your interior is turned to the outside and the outside's turned to the inside. And you know, when you're in the glass house, you feel very much like you're in a landscape. And when you're outside of it, you're viewing the way these folks are moving through space in their own right. personal space, right? And so like a, this, and like a vitrine in a museum. Exactly. Yeah. So there's there's this like inside outside thing that yeah. goes on with that that's just fascinating to me, and um, it is the cornerstone piece of of architecture of modernism. It represents just about everything. Um, so. It's a it's a fascinating piece when you think about that, and then you you know and Hitchcock and what he meant to filmmaking and um, the, the film Marnie, which was sort of kind of one of his left out pieces. You know, when you talk about Hitchcock, you're thinking about North by Northwest, you're thinking about the birds, you're thinking you know the Psycho, all of these. You know, Marnie doesn't really unless you're a, a Hitchcock fan, it doesn't right. really come to the front of your brain. But then you start thinking that here's this woman that's so physically affected by this color that she you know, supposedly goes mad every time that she sees this color and she goes into this weird rage and, and things. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, that idea about women and madness has a long history to it too. Mm -hmm. So I, I loved the physicality of taking a color mm -hmm. and making it you know, this physical presence. So, when I make those choices to, about color, it's because of reasons like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a random, oh look, that's a pretty red. It's like, no, it's mm -hmm. not a pretty red. Yeah, yeah. It might be a pretty red, it is, but yeah. it's also <laughs> a pretty red. red. Yeah. It has a lot of other <laughs> aspects. Yeah. Too. So I think like, uh, like maybe earlier this week, Renee, you called um, Gary a colorist, and you really kind of cringed <laughs> yeah, yeah. at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was like, but, ooh, what? <laughs> but I meant that very much like, um, that you're a colorist in a conceptual fashion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That you are using color in, or lack of color in these very intentional ways to signify things, uh, to signify this or that. Um, but yeah, I, I love how the show has this kind of rhythm to it, like from intense color to mm -hmm. black to all light. To, and that's your, uh, you, you see that in, in your work and that, the, tra the trajectory of your work. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah. So, um, the 1964 uh, triptych, obviously, it's, uh, you know, these are works that are made on site, uh, and in general, um, they're very ephemeral, right? And that comes to, uh, that brings us to uh, really one of, the mo one of the major themes in your work, the idea of fleetingness and permanence, particularly the impermanence of memory, mm -hmm. and the way that memory um, kind of paradoxically uh, is always in the process of disappearing, and yet if you try to get rid of it, if you try to erase it, if you try to eradicate a bad cultural, social me memory, you're not going to be able to get rid of it all the way, right? It's never going to completely go away. So um, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, particularly with respect to the chalkboard pieces and uh, your kind of earliest uh, forays uh, into the, 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 with your erasure technique? Yeah, um, you know, the erasures, uh, I'll tell you a, a quick story about how the erasures came about. I, I was working in a vocational school and um, I was helping renovate a space that had all these chalkboards in it. And um, part of the exchange was that I was given studio space for work to reconstruct this, this space. So I chose this space where all these chalkboards were being stored. And, um, you know, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that over there. And, and so if I wanted to work on, like, this wall, I would have to move all the chalkboards to this side of the, the studio. And um, I'm sitting in my studio, and I'm racking my brains, and I'm saying, like, well, you know, I, I really need, like, this object that speaks to, like, Education, and <laughs> pedagogy, teaching, and learning, and <laughs> students, and oh, let me move these chalkboards. So, <laughs> you know, and then suddenly, midway through, I'm like, that, what the fuck? What, like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. when you just use these? So, um, I started cutting them up and, you know, treating, you know, try to rendering them, um, you know incapable of, of, of drawing on them by doing like black chalk on blackboards, white chalk on whiteboards, this kind of thing. So I, I basically I had painted this perfect black chalkboard and um, somehow I got this mark on it. And I couldn't erase it. Like I tried to get it off and I realized like, wow, this, that's an interesting idea that you, you can mark a chalkboard surface and, and you can never truly get rid of it. So speeding forward, I did an exhibition in Los Angeles, and um, I, I did this piece called Polywana, which uh, unfortunately we couldn't put in the show because it has a live bird yeah. in it, and people would have been upset about the bird. Yeah. Um, but it, it was a trained bird that was uh, like a Hollywood bird. So it wasn't like a torturing an animal kind of a thing. She, she, was, she wasn't attached or chained or any of that. She just sat on her perch and marched along and she, ate. she had food and water and stuff and she'd eat. And she would yell different things to people that came in because there was a live mic on this, this lectern, very much like that lectern there. So imagine a live bird just kind of, you know, a cockatoo. And people would walk in and she'd yell, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> and then she'd say, you know, I love you and I Lolita and like all these crazy things. And it was sort of like a Vito Acconci piece where he was sitting up in the, in the rafters yelling. And, uh, you know, and then the bird would, would kind of, you know, stretch its, its wings. And I painted behind her this blackboard surface. So the, the, the contrast of the wings against this black, deep, matte blackboard was like incredibly beautiful to watch these wings like go up and down. And it created this kind of almost like an acid trail. I saw, wow, that's a really beautiful image. I gotta get back to New York and start doing images on these chalkboards, this is amazing. So then it occurred to me, Hang on, I have the whole thing with the eraser. So I started to take images from like old, you know, 30s and 40s race cartoons and attempt to erase them. That was the, the birth of the 
erasure drawings. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of, it became this thing where um, the more I erased it and the more absence that occurred, it, it forced this position of the viewer to kind of fill in all of those lines and all of those gaps and, and, and recall through their own experience, not only the school thing, but where they saw these images before. Mm -hmm. So it, it operated on multiple levels and I thought, wow, this is truly fascinating, you know, to take this kind of imagery and dig into the memory bank of people that have seen these cartoons before in a way that I had never seen. So that was, that was really where they came from. It's interesting because, uh, you know, one of the ways to kind of break down your work or to kind of locate a pattern in the work is to think about how, um, you know, on one hand, via these motifs, via these images, you're communicating references, facts, you know, things that um, we're invited to research further. Um, but if you kind of zoom out a little bit, uh, one sees that you're also really focusing on the different social mechanisms by which these images and these lessons, these ideas are conveyed, right? So you're, you know, um, the sports is a big one. Uh, the education system, of course, is a big one. But then with this one, you know, obviously you're talking about education, but you're also talking about TV, yeah. cartoons, right? Yeah. Um, clearly, one of the major ways we receive our knowledge of the world, and starting really early, yeah. right, mm -hmm. um, is through film and television. Yeah. And um, from here going forward, a lot of your work really deals with with that kind of media and the ways that film and television, car from cartoons to, you know, and also, you know, it could be Ingmar Bergman or it could be like a B-movie, like, uh, you know, the, the seventh installment of the Planet of the Apes or whatever. Um, it, they, the, they are equally capable mm -hmm. of summing up some social ideas and particularly social anxieties and uh, kinds of, um, uh, yeah, movies has, have a way of sublimating uh, our, our um, social, the things that we're, we're grappling with as a society. Right? Yeah. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit um, with regard to, uh, what do you say, um, let's say the Planet of the Apes series? Uh, oh yeah, I yeah, can talk the forever Red, the Red about series. Planet of the Apes, man. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's, my, uh, that's my film. Uh, do you know, I think that uh, science fiction is one of the most interesting genres of film uh, to talk about race and class. I think that uh, it's, it's one of the few genres that you can, uh, you know, directly talk about the other by using a stand-in, like uh, the alien in Aliens, mm -hmm. um, or something like, Planet of the Apes, where the, the fear is this upside down society of the apes, uh, you know, overtaking society and, and, and running things. And this is the biggest fear. And, you know, how they're, uh, you know, particularly in conquest with Planet of the Apes, it, it, it mirrors kind of the Black Panthers and the, the riots of Detroit and, um, uh, uh, in New Jersey, so there were there were a number of ri Watts riots. You know, there were a number of riots that were going on in that film at that time. It was '68 or between '68 and '71, um, where that film came from. And so the the main character, the main uh, ape, is really, you know, he's the leader essentially of this society that's taking over the Earth, and the, the humans are just completely beside themselves, like this is gonna happen and they're gonna be enslaved and, and, and all of this. And so you can talk about those things and those issues through these kind of characters and it's totally accessible and believable and open to discussion. So you literally are having conversations about race and class while talking about Planet of the Apes yeah. and it's mm -hmm. totally okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that science fiction is, is one of those few genres that actually carves through a lot of that. 
Um, so that's one of the reasons why it keeps popping up in the work. It's one of those, um, I think there's, uh, some horror films is, is a similar thing where you have something like um, Night of the Living Dead or um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre where you, you, know, you have these characters that are you know, in a state of otherness. So it, it, it's easiest to talk about those things through film because we can sit there and we have a history of sitting for two hours and being entertained watching, you know, Harry love Sally or Mary or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, certainly, I mean, you think about, I mean, let's go back to like Godzilla. Uh, right. That, that uh, I'm, in many ways, I, I think that movie is uh, the expression of anxieties uh, in the wake of, um, you know, Hiroshima and mm -hmm. Nagasaki, right? And, uh, or if you think about, um, you know, I, the other day I mentioned Avatar. Right. Mm -hmm. And Avatar, uh, the not the manga cartoon, the, uh, the uh, James, James Cameron, Cameron yeah. films. Um, you know, there's this incredible like um, fetishization of the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. right? Meanwhile, we're invading Iraq. You know, uh, all these ways in which films kind of like they're talking about one thing, but they're really, if you read between talking the lines, another. they're talking about another thing. Yeah. Uh, and I get that a lot from from your work over yeah. and over again. And, um, yeah, and then um, I, I wanted to go back quickly since we're, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, coming to, to the end of time. I just wanted to kind of um, go a little bit farther into your career toward the, uh, the end part of the, um, of the exhibition. Um, and for that, I want to return to this idea of the missing figure, the missing mm -hmm. body, uh, like that body that's missing from Step in the Arena or from Lineup. Um, just after this series, where you are using that erasure technique to conjure not just the idea of something that's fading, that's going away, but specifically with a series, uh, the appearance of film mm -hmm. kind of stuck in the projector, like, right? Like, let's go to Mother Oh Mother, for example. We saw that one earlier, right? Um, like film stills kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of, again, stuck in the projector. Uh, just after that, you did a series uh, of end credits, mm -hmm. right? um, paintings that um, display names or fragments of names of uh, important black actors mm -hmm. from um, usually, mainly the, the earlier part of, uh, of, of Hollywood history, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about this series? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, well, there it is, you know, Hattie McDaniels and, and um, Bill Robinson. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that my interest in that was, uh, you know, there's this whole genre of black silent film actors and actresses that existed in these films that set the stage for your Halle Berry's, your Denzel Washington's, your, you know, fill in the blank mm -hmm. of great black actors. I think that there were folks that came before them that paved the way, that struggled through a lot of the politics. You think about Paul Robeson, you know, um, was an was a incredible historical figure um, who, who struggled with, with um, societal positioning. Um, you think about Hattie McDaniel, somebody that uh, you've seen from anywhere from Gone with the Wind to numerous uh, silent films and uh, won an Oscar, actually. Um, I, th I believe she's the first black actress to win an, an Oscar and wasn't even invited to the presentation of, of that Oscar. So, you know, there there's a lot of reforming or reanalyzing history, but when you look at what those folks went through that's now forgotten, there's, there's slippages in time. Like you look back and they're read in a certain light of like, oh, they were you know, doing step and fetch at things. How could they represent the culture this way, this and that and the other. But you have to actually look at what the circumstances and context that they were in at the time. And I think that there's some amazing figures that Hollywood would not be Hollywood without those figures in them. And they're kind of ghosts that haunt Hollywood to this day. It's always about that kind of ghosting 
And those end credits is, is just that. It's those credits that usually everybody gets up and leaves the theater before those end credits continue to roll. But those are the folks that actually make the film. There's the structure, the backbone of how this thing is made. It's not just the part in the beginning where they're like entertaining. And I've always been, you know, even when I was a little guy, I would sit to the very end until that, um, I think it's SAG, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, the icon at the, at the end would pass through and I'd go, okay, now we can leave. Like the lights are on. <laughs> but it, it just meant something to me that who are all these names? I was always fascinated by who are all these names at the end of the film, you know, who, what's a gaffer? You know, <laughs> what's, a, what's a boom operator? You know, like all of those guys. And I think that those are like the invisible folks that make a film happen. And with the end credits, it's those figures and those films are kind of almost forgotten. And they're on that like endless reel that just continues to, to go through history. So um, I love the, the, uh, the end credit paintings. Paul Robeson, uh, yeah, you were saying, uh, he was, uh, Daniel, go back to the, the image before of him protesting. He was, uh, Again, an incredible, incredible performer. Uh, he was also very politically active. And um, thanks to that activity, he was totally persecuted by the FBI, uh, surveilled by J. Edgar Hoover's uh, uh, secret teams, uh, blacklisted by McCarthy. Uh, they ruined his life, you know? And so it's like these names are, um, and, and the way that the names appear in your work, they're, um, they're, they're veiling these stories, these incredible stories that are really worth remembering. They're, mm -hmm. It's very important that we don't let, forget them. Absolutely. So in a way, they're kind of like stuck in time, right? And the, the way that you've pictured them. Um, and, um, you know, I think what, something that's really fascinating, uh, again, going back to this like absent figure, uh, whereas in the early work, that absent figure is very anonymous and generic mm -hmm. in lineup or in step into the arena here for the first time or rather with a boxing series that came right before it, uh, for the first time, you're giving just enough information to identify yep. that figure, right? Just enough to give you a, like a trail of breadcrumbs to follow, yep. to, to pursue this kind of research, right? Um, so I think something that's really, I think, powerful in the show and in your work in general is these like returns that are very pointed, very intentional, and very um, meaningful, right? So that return to the absent figure um, in um, the films or in the boxing works, um, but this time naming him, there's a lot that you can pull out of that. Um, and then the show ends with another very, very significant return, right? Um, at the very end, yes, we have a series of paintings that are depicting cartoon characters after a hiatus of almost 30 years, yep. right? I mean, you had been um, throughout those years depicting maybe architecture from cartoons or the star motif or whatever, but as far as like the figures, yep. it had been something like 30 years. Yeah, it's been a while. And it was really meaningful. And if you think about how your treatment of the figures in these later works differs from the early ones. That's, that's, uh, there's, I think there's a lot to pull out of that. So, I don't know. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, this, this decision to return to the figurative cartoon imagery around 2020. Well, to be honest, um, working on this show um, helped uncover some of that. I think that, you know, every artist, and I'm sure there's a bunch of artists out there that, um, that have been working. And you're not really thinking about 30 years out. You're not even thinking five years out. I mean, when I started working, I wasn't even thinking 18 months out. <laughs> you know, if we sold a piece, I would be so stoked that I could go to the bar and actually buy my friends drinks. That was like, that was a successful like month. You know, and then I'd be broke again and I'd have to jump turnstiles and like <laughs> hang pictures on 57th Street. Um, but I think once you start looking at, uh, looking back to put together an exhibition like this, it's, it can be, I've watched other artists that I admire putting together, um, surveys and retrospectives and things, and some of them became paralyzed, you know, they, they couldn't move. They felt like 
you know, I have to, I'm forced in this position to end this journey that I've been on and start a new one. And I always thought, wow, that's, that's a very ominous way to look at things, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like death. It, it was, if you use those rules, then probably you, shouldn't, you should wait until you're you know, deep into your 90s or something mm -hmm. to do um, a retrospective and truly look back at, the, at the, your life's work. Um, but for me, it actually woke up a lot of, um, well, let me put it this way. I think when you're younger, you're very eager to make big, brash statements, mm -hmm. right? And you, you don't know, particularly when a lot of this work was made, we didn't know if we were going to have other opportunities to show again. So you want to make your biggest, hardest hitting, you know, Mike Tyson punch you in the face kind of, you know, moves. And um, it's like, well, if I'm not going to be here, God damn it, I'm going to lay somebody out. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, and so you, you did these things that were loud and made a lot of noise. I mean, don't forget, I have to, I'm putting up this little group show. I got like, you know, Bruce Nauman down the way, blowing out two galleries and killing it. So <laughs> how am I going to make any noise next to Bruce Nauman? Um, but the thing was, was uh, I, I think that you start to amass a kind of, uh, you know, vo visual vocabulary. And you're, you start to, these become your tools. These become the friends that you go to to start putting things together. Like, you know, what I call visual DJ, the way you're starting to like mix images and starting to become comfortable and moving around through language. You know, when, when you have a little child and, and they just start to speak, you know, they make really cute mistakes with language. But then it becomes a little nuanced and they start saying, you know, other things because they're amassing all of these, you know, different vocabularies. I think an artist is the same thing. As you start to do that, you're starting to fill your toolbox up and you can use them in conjunction with other things. And, and the problem is, is that you, since you move, you do what I call like kind of artist frogger. Anybody remember that, that video game where you, yeah. you have this little frog and he has to run through traffic and you wait for the cars to go and there's a little blank and poop, then you jump up to the next level and you, and it, it, it's kind of a lot like that, right? Because you're, you're sort of like, well, I got this idea, I better get this idea out. Then I get up here and I go, tick, 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 tick. then I, oh, then I fell down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I fucked up and I had to go back to the beginning. So now, tick, 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 you know, and so you're playing and playing and, and you're going along. Um, what you're doing is, is also amassing all these images and things that become connected to who and what you are as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at this show, really, I started looking at things and saying, wow, you know, hang on, I haven't really finished with that area of work. Mm -hmm. And those guys, are my friends. Like I can call them back up and say, hey, let's, let's get back to work. You know, like early on you were about drawing and it was a very much about, they represented a certain kind of conceptual model. The surfaces that those were drawn on represented a very hard line thing. Now, longer into my career, I'm more interested in painting and more interested in the act of painting, more interested in creating um, grounds and, and, and you know, how backdrops, you know, how backgrounds are working and layering and, and all of these kinds of things. And those, those paintings, the newer paintings are so, when you look at them, mm -hmm. there's so many layers on those things. Yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of that comes from looking at older vintage chalkboards where you start seeing like, you know, paint that was rubbed into the surface and scraped away. And, you know, there's that, mm -hmm. that kind of beautiful patina to the surface and then that's really what I was after was how colors and things were revealed under things so there's this constant ghosting that's going on mm -hmm. and that's where the paintings kind of come back to life and these these figures just started to appear again mm -hmm. and it feels very fresh in in that way because it's about paint early on it was about drawing and now mm -hmm. it's you know moved into the interesting into yeah. the painting thing ghosts of ghosts of ghosts of ghosts. Ghosts of ghosts of ghosts, yeah. Ghosts all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> I got one big haunted house going. I don't know. <laughs> Anything you guys would like to add? Um, well, I have a question for you, actually, if you don't oh, mind. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll give Gary a break for a minute. We've been grilling you for <laughs> an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, so 
Renee, you've been working on the show a lot longer than Jade Dean and I have. You started working on it before the pandemic with Gary um, while you were still at Perez Art Museum Miami. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you came here, you invited Jade Dean to join you on the project. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk about uh, like what this show means to you now oh, and like, and like why, why is it important to have this oh, wow. huge Gary Simmons retrospective mm -hmm. now? That's a great question. Um, yeah, this project really is uh, incredibly meaningful for me. Um, we've been working on it for a while. Uh, a long time. And I would say like a lot of the conceptual part, uh, we worked on uh, together at an early phase, but then the pandemic happened. We had to kind of drop this exhibition for a while. When I started here at uh, MCA, it was a little bit of like a rush to catch up. So even though it's been a long time, it was sort of very much like hurry up, stop, hurry up, yeah. You know? <laughs> and um, but uh, yeah, the show is. Um, uh, I feel like I've just grown so much, just learning from your work, learning from uh, all of the uh, the source material that you work from, and um, all the while it's. Uh, I've always had this kind of uncanny feeling of how relevant, how incredibly timely this work is. And, um, you know, the, ultimately your work is about memory, collective memory, what gets remembered, what doesn't. Uh, and what um, political, social realities affect what gets remembered and what doesn't, right? Um, what memories get buried? and omitted and meanwhile you know we're talking about presenting some of this very hard-hitting work uh, in a context that um, has become very sensitive right it's a, a sensitive social moment it's a turbulent social time and um, this is com a complex thing to do um, and for me ultimately for all of us I think uh, the idea that um, you, the histories, the stories that you're pointing out, that you're working with in your work, um, it's so important that they never get forgotten. It's so important that we are able to um, maintain a sense of the past. And um, n never before, I would say, has our sense of a shared history been so fragile and so Mm -hmm. our, our sense of history has been it fragmented into a million pieces because of social media, because of um, Trump, you know, like uh, what, what's real, what's not real. We have uh, so many people in our country uh, thinking about uh, U.S. history in a way that's completely different from how other people are thinking about it. And uh, it just becomes that much more important that we do not look away from these histories, that we do not try to erase them. And ultimately that's what, what your work is about. It's about these histories, these, um, these, um, these narratives that um, as much as so many, as difficult as they are to look at, uh, to revisit, um, you know, you have all these people trying to erase them, but they, they, they won't all go away. These are unresolved issues that we're still very much coping with. And, I think uh, 2020, uh, between the pandemic, between Trump, between you know um, the murder of George Floyd, uh, made all of these kinds of questions all the more important to think about now, and for us to take a position, a stand on, uh, the kind of position, the stand that you've always taken. So it's just never felt more timely. You know, we're in a moment where uh, the 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 version of history, the version of the past that uh, is being promoted out there uh, is very much under contention. I mean, it always is, but it's very, very much under contention now. Uh, so it's just all the more important um, to, to be active, to be critical, to interrogate, uh, to research, uh, to um, uh, think about which kind of history we want to preserve and mm -hmm. what do we want to have for ourselves and for our kids. How about you guys? I mean, what do you think uh, as far as the, the sort of the timeliness of the show, the, the, the currency of it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think you put it so beautifully and 
I feel like, you know, again, like I'm so thankful from kind of being able to follow the, your work and kind of learn from it. It really kind of, you know, for me, forced me as a, you know, kind of young emerging curator to really take a position and, and really say, you know, for me, it's so important, I think, that, that we confront these difficult histories. And that's something that I think I've always held as a conviction, but it was like, you couldn't be on the fence doing this show, right? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you had to go right. all the way you in on pick it. A <laughs> yeah, and so then I was like, all right, this is who I am as a curator, this is what I'm doing, and, you know, I feel like, you know, it's important to support um, work that's taking risks like this. Um, and, yeah, so it's been really a, a great experience to, to curate it with, with you and with Jack as well, and, um, yeah, we've had like amazing conversations, I think, amongst ourselves and our institution and our team um, that have been just, I've learned so much from. So. It's been so rewarding, this yeah. whole process. So ultimately, that's like, you know, to answer your, your question, Jack, I think the process has been so rich, so deep. The conversations have been so profound, so stimulating. We've all, I feel like we've all learned so much from them that that's ultimately what has made this project so incredibly uh, important for me and hopefully for uh, you guys as well and hopefully for all of you. So. Well, thank you all so much uh, for coming today. Um, and